Hey everybody, welcome to Diversity, the final showdown. Uh, in the last, uh, this lecture is brought to you by the University of Oregon Law School, where I organized a forum on hate crimes. Good people down there in Eugene. Uh, the final two weeks we're focusing on how we respond, ways to think about uh, diversity, how we make diversity an action item, how we improve things like equity and inclusion in our world. And the frame of this last piece is kind of the idea that we work on these things on three levels. And we're going to kind of be, be discussing these three levels over the next two weeks. The first is the institutional level, how we change the laws. So we had a discussion last week about the laws around the issue of sexual harassment and gender discrimination, uh, how we change them culturally, how we organize ourselves on a Saturday night. What do we do on Memorial Day when we... No, we don't have to be anywhere else. Well, you know, when the days when we could sort of have uh, community meetings and events. Uh, and then the third level is how we handle it on an individual personal level. So we're going to get into a discussion this week about the concept of privilege um, and especially around the issue of ableism. So we uh, so those three levels, the institutional level, the cultural level and the uh, personal level. Those are the three fronts that we confront. Um, the need to improve, yeah, make things better. We are the world. That record's up here somewhere. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today is a little bit about the uh, the cultural level, how we respond on a cultural level. And I'm going to talk about one specific cultural response in this lecture video, something called the not in our town response. And the not in our town response comes from the world of hate crimes, uh, but it off offers kind of a glimpse on how we respond to this issue of trauma how we as community members can reduce the trauma in a community. So let me give you a little background. This all starts way back in the 1990s uh, in a place called Billings, Montana. Billings, Montana, the, you know, the northwest part of the country has been, for various reasons, a kind of haven for white supremacists. There was a white supremacist compound in Idaho called the Aryan Nations Compound for many, many years until a civil rights group called the Southern Poverty Law Center sued them off the land, but they were preparing for a race war. There have been uh, armed gangs that have robbed and killed people in the Northwest as they get ready for their race war. There, there has been... Um, a kind of long history of the Northwest as a white-only territory, including the forming of Oregon as a state that was written into its constitution that no uh, Negroes or mulattoes shall be allowed to live in the state uh, confines or no Chinese people should be allowed to own property. That was written into the original 1859 constitution. No longer there. Good to tell you. In fact, they took the language out in 2001. Sometimes we're a little slow on these things. So the point is, there has been a kind of hotbed bed of sort of white supremacist ideology and activism in the Northwest since its founding, since the very beginning, since the Oregon Trail days. Uh, I was uh, at a tribal meeting at Kenita, oh, Kenita, in Warm Springs, and a tribal elder said, Randy, you know when it got bad for Native people here in the Northwest? And I said, well, when would that be? He said, Lewis and Clark. So there's a long history of whiteness supplanting uh, other groups. That being said, uh, the 1990s were a particularly hot time uh, for these groups uh, in the Northwest, including Montana. There is this notion called the uh, Northwest Imperative, where hate groups believe that they could secede this section, this corner of the United States, and create their own white-only uh, territory. There's still an online version of this called Cascadia, a sort of oh, an Aryan version of Cascadia that believes that you know white supremacists should gravitate to uh, the Northwest and start a civil war and they'd all be happy here. And I'm like, Seattle. Lots of luck with Seattle. There's some guns in Seattle that might have uh, some other things to say about that. Anyway, so we're going to uh, Billings, Montana, kind of a college town, but right in the middle of like the, you know, the pastoral Northwest in the early 90s when a lot of this was happening. In fact, Billings, Montana had seen a spike in anti-Semitism uh, the Jewish synagogue there had been attacked and flyered. There had uh, tombstones in the graveyard had been turned over. And so this brings us to the holiday season of 1993, December 1993. And December, you know, Jewish, the Jewish community in the Northwest is relatively small. I mean, even in a city like Portland, um, it's not that big compared to places back east. And so uh, to be a, a Jew in Billings, Montana, you have a relatively small, isolated community. And 
when we get into the holiday season, a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, Christians start getting excited about Christmas. Christmas is just around the corner. Actually, I think they start getting ready for Christmas around the 4th of July now. But, um, you know, when you're in early December, you're fully on into the Christmas season. But also, if you're a Jew, it's the Hanukkah, Hanukkah season. And Hanukkah has had to sort of assimilate to compete with Christmas. It's sort of a minor Jewish holiday. But, you know, us Jewish kids deserve presents, too. So one of the symbols of Hanukkah is the Hanukkah menorah, which is different than the regular menorah because it has eight candles representing the eight nights of miracle and then the one candle to light them all. And it's become kind of a universal symbol of the celebration of Hanukkah. Well, in Billings, Montana, there was a family that lived, uh, a Jewish family that lived in the community and they had a six-year-old son who made a paper menorah to put in the window uh, to, you know, celebrate his faith tradition as kids do. Kids make Christmas trees. Kids make Christmas stars. Um, he made a menorah and a cinder block was thrown through that child's window. Um, and there had been some graffiti, some anti-Semitic graffiti around. So it was very clear what that was all about. And the community uh, could have said, well, that sucks to be you. I guess that's what happens. Um, the local Billings, Montana paper did a story on it. In fact, the mother of this young boy called the Billings Gazette to say, hey, I, you need to know what's happening in this town. And they did a little story about it. And the community around this child's house, uh, who were for the most part Christian, came to their Jewish neighbors and said, hey, it's your faith tradition, so we want to ask permission, but it would be okay if we put menorahs in our windows because we don't want people to think that we're on the side of the people that did this even though we're, we're Christians and we're celebrating Christmas and they said yeah sure just go down to the synagogue buy you a Hanukkah menorah and uh, you can put it in your window hey Cos, what's going on you're supposed to be in bed my love I knew it was there's something in your ear okay the CD ended the frozen CD ended mm -hmm. okay I gotta go put frozen back on I'll be right back Okay, we're back. Frozen soundtrack is on. I got a cookie. Back to Billings, Montana, 1993. So the, the local community um, who were Christians put menorahs in their window to show solidarity with the victims of this horrible crime in which this 16-year-old boy must have been seriously traumatized. I mean, you know, kids, I mean, especially in the Jewish tradition, they know about the history that that the Jews have faced. And imagine having a cinder block come crashing through your window when you were that young, especially when things had been happening, including the synagogue being vandalized. It must've just been really hard for that child and that family. So the Billings Gazette did a story on it. it said this community wanted to show support for the victims uh, and put menorahs in their window. People read the story and went to the synagogue and they sold out of menorahs. <laughs> So the Billings Gazette did a story about that, and they put a full-page picture of a menorah in their um, in their newspaper, the Billings Gazette. Uh, and suddenly, there were uh, ten thousand menorahs in the windows of Billings, Montana. Billings, Montana looked like the most Jewish city in America because all these people uh, wanted to show solidarity with the victims. And so that became what we call the not in our town response. Because we think about not in our town a lot. Like not in our town, don't build a toxic waste dump in our town. Not in our town, don't build a you know, high speed railroad. You know, there's always people like saying, not in my backyard. This is a different kind of not in our town. This is about hate and intolerance. And the reason I'm highlighting this Billings, Montana story is, first of all, it's been replicated num a number of times, including here in Portland, Oregon. We had... Uh, a gay couple who was attacked walking across the Hawthorne Bridge because they were holding hands. That's all they were doing. And there was a big march, a Not In Our Town march, where it was called Hands Across Hawthorne, where people, gay, straight, and otherwise, walked across the bridge to hold hands. And what that, uh, we, we did it uh, in uh, 2001, we had a cross burning in Southeast Portland, a cross burning in Southeast Portland. Um, we had a Not In Our Town march uh, around that. And so th the reason this is relevant for our discussion is around this issue of trauma. It's a not in our town uh, response. The idea that the community comes together no matter who they are. Because it could have been, you know, they could have been like, well, Jews, you know, Jews get used to it. 
I mean, it could have been sort of that's that's your story. But people stepped up and said, no, they are members of our community. And, and what that does is sort of two really important things. The first thing is it sends a message to the people who commit the hate crime. I might look like you. I might pray like you. I might love like you. I might live like you. But I'm not with you. You know, if somebody burns a cross in southeast Portland, white people could be like, oh, well, you know, whatever. That's what, that's what happens. Portland's racist. What are you going to do about it? But white people wanted to say, hey, I might look like the guys that did this. I don't stand with them. I am not with them. I am con condemning them. So that's the first value of the Not In Our Town response is to separate yourself from the people who committed the crime to let them know. Because, you know, they think silence is complicity. Have you ever heard that line? Silence is complicity. I mean, when I uh, was studying skinheads in Southeast Portland, I was doing a little work at a high school where they would go in and look at the skinheads would have someone go in and look at the graffiti on the men's room wall. And if there was anti-gay or anti-Latino a graffiti and nobody said anything about it, nobody raised an objection, nobody said, hey, you know, somebody wrote something racist in the men's room on, you know, aisle seven. Uh, they had a way in. They felt like, you know, people aren't objecting to it. There's a lot of people that agree with us neo-Nazis. So the first part of this is really important is to say to those people, I'm not with you. Don't think that just because I look like you, I'm with you or that I'm the same religion or whatever. So that's the first part. But the second part, which is even more powerful and plays into this theme that we've had in this course, is to the victims themselves. Because as we've talked about, they are, there are layers of trauma that go along with the hate crime. They go along with the people who are traumatized. That six-year-old boy, good God, you know, they need to interview him now because I'm sure he remembers that night like it was yesterday. And that family and the Jewish community in Billings, Montana, but also other minority communities, also Native Americans and black folks have been targeted in Billings, Montana. So their trauma levels go up. Uh, Jewish communities around the country, you know, then the larger community, like all those ripples of trauma that we talked about. It sends a message to those folks that I might not look like you or I might not pray like you or I might not, not love like you or live like you, but I am with you. I am on your side. I'm not on their side, even though I look like them. I'm on your side. And I want you to know that I have your back. And on a certain level, we haven't quantified this, but on a certain level, you could imagine that that would reduce the, hump, the trauma and increase some of the healing that's needed when people are traumatized. To have the community come together. And the members of that family who have spoken in documentaries on TV shows and things since the crime happened, said that meant so much to them to have their non-Jewish community members come out and stand up for them, that it really helped them realize that they were not all alone, because that's the feeling of vulnerability you get when you've been the victim of this type of thing. So if we think about the Not In Our Town response as a way of saying, I might not be disabled, but I'm going to stand with my disabled brothers and sisters. I might not be gay, but those people are my people, and I stand with them. I might not be black, uh, and might not understand a lot of the things that go on because of my white fragility and all that stuff, but I'm going to throw my allegiance over there. I'm going to listen to them first. And so that allows us to start having a conversation, which we're going to get into, about what it means to be an ally. How can I participate in the protection and liberation of groups that I'm not a member of? in a responsible, meaningful way, where I'm not just sort of speaking for them. Well, let me tell you about the Jews. I saw Schindler's List, so I'm an expert on Nazis. You know, how do we listen to those communities and respond to what their needs are in a way that heals the trauma that's been the result of all this drama? The trauma from the drama. <laughs> okay, that I just wanted to throw that little bit out because that's a one really important way that communities can respond uh, when there is um, when there is trauma associated around these diversity issues, not in our town, stand with the victims, and then we'll talk about how we help the people that did it. All right, let me eat my chocolate chip cookie. Talk to you soon.